Good morning, everyone. The last minutes of the morning on Tuesday, March 16th, 2021. I wanted to uh, greet everyone. Um, I don't know about you, but sometimes um, the time change when we spring forward really kind of affects me. So I was kind of, kind of, <laughs> excuse me, I was kind of droggy as I was waking up today, so I couldn't get a video out. So um, this is live, but ultimately it'll be available on Facebook. And um, I want to do a special video today. It's going to be a little bit longer. Uh, so if you have the time, great. If you don't have the time, you can watch uh, later. Is um, like I like we've been going through the last uh, week uh, a lot in our community as we mourn for the loss of uh, Jameson Meyer, and we pray that God's mercy may be touching um, his family and God's mercy may be touching Jameson. But in the last week, I've been talking a lot about grief uh, with people. Uh, I started with the seventh and eighth graders at St. Teresa of Calcutta School in our theology classes, and uh, been talking with a lot of individual conversations with people about grief and the difficulty of what we're going through. And Sunday night, I did a session with our high school youth who came to Life Night. I'm very thankful for the people that did come. And we recorded that. We're gonna send that off to the parents as well. But I thought uh, it'd be really good to share with you what I shared with our students in the last week because I really think it could help uh, parents, parents and adults on how to speak to people about grief and really about grieving, how to grieve with Jesus, how to grieve with Jesus. Uh, so that's what's going to be our little uh, talk here today, and I wanted to put it up on Facebook. And um, um, just want to share that with you. So in the post, I put the handout that I put together for uh, these talks that I've been giving, and uh, I just want to go through it with you. And um, I hope it helps you. I hope you listen to it. Um, there's a lot of wisdom in our Catholic faith on how to deal with grief and suffering and difficulty. And it's basically um, accepting who we are and how we respond and how God wants to lead us to, uh, into that. So uh, so that's what we're going to be talking about. Let me close the door so I don't get interrupted. Okay, the door is closed. That's good. Okay, let's start with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. There's the opening prayer. God, lover of souls, you hold dear what you have made, and spare all things, for they are yours. Look gently on us, your servants, and by the blood of the cross, forgive our sins and failings. Remember the faith of those who mourn and satisfy their longing for that day when all will be made new again in Christ our risen Lord who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay. Grief. Um, what is grief and how to grieve with Jesus? That's what we'll be talking about today. So I just want to give a definition of grief. Grief is deep sorrow that is caused by someone's death. It's the most simple, uh, most simple of definitions. When somebody dies that we love, no matter the manner in which they die, we are given the experience, the emotion, the state of grief. Deep sorrow for someone who has died. All of us are going to face sorrow. Uh, all of us are going to have to mourn in our lives. But grieving with Jesus is different than grieving than grieving without Jesus. Uh, grieving with Jesus is different than grieving than without Jesus. So today I want to show how grieving with Jesus looks. And I want to do it with a story in which Jesus actually grieves. So let me get my Bible. Where is it? There it is. 
And um, we're going to read the story of the raising of Lazarus, which is John chapter 11. So if you can, if you have a Bible handy, you can follow along. If you want to look it up on your app or look it up on your, yeah, whatever. Whatever your Bible is. I'm going to read it to you. And I want you to, I want to ask this question. What three emotions do you hear that Jesus has during this time? Okay, so I'm going to read it now. Ready? A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. John. Now a man was ill, Lazarus from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who had anointed the Lord with perfumed oil and dried his feet with her hair. It was her brother Lazarus who was ill. So the sisters sent word to him saying, Master, the one you love is ill. When Jesus heard this, he said, This illness is not to end in death, but is for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was ill, he remained for two days in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just trying to stone you and you want to go back there? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in a day? If one walks during the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if one walks at night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. He said this and then told them, our friend Lazarus is asleep, but I am going to awaken him. So the disciples said to him, Master, if he is asleep, he will be saved. But Jesus was talking about his death while they thought he meant ordinary sleep. So then Jesus said to them clearly, Lazarus has died. And I'm glad for you that I was not there, that you may believe. Let us go to him. So Thomas, called Didymus, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go to die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, only about two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him, but Mary sat at home. Mary said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise. Martha said to him, I know he will rise in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, even if he dies, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Jesus, she said to him, yes, Lord, I have come to believe that you are the Messiah, the son of God, the one who is coming into the world. When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary secretly saying, the teacher is here and is asking for you. As soon as she heard this, she rose quickly and went to him. For Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still where Martha had met him. So when the Jews who were with her in the house comforting her saw Mary get up quickly and go out, they followed her, presuming that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her weeping, he became perturbed and deeply troubled and said, where have you laid him? They said to him, sir, come and see. And Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not the one who opened the eyes of the blind man have done something so that this man would not have died? So Jesus perturbed again came to the tomb. It was a cave and the stone and a stone lay across it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the dead man's sister, said to him, Lord, by now there will be a stench. He has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believe you will see the glory of God? 
So they took away the stone and Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you for hearing me. I know that you always hear me, but because of the crowd here, I have said this, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said this, he cried out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, tied hand and foot with burial cloths, and his face was wrapped in a cloth. So Jesus said to them, untie him and let him go. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. One of the more powerful stories in the Bible. So what are the three emotions that Jesus has in this um, in this story? The first one he has is love. I mean, love is deeper than in an emotion, but he had strong feelings for Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. He loved them. They were his friends, deep, close friends. It's where they went to rest when they needed a place to rest. What's the second emotion that Jesus had? Jesus had sadness. The shortest verse in the Bible is in this story, and Jesus wept, and Jesus wept. He wept. He wept for Lazarus. He wept for the sadness. He saw the sadness of Martha and Mary. He just, he wept. What's the third emotion he had? He was perturbed, deeply troubled. He was angry. Angry. So if Jesus loved, was sad, and was angry, that means you and I can love, be sad, and can be angry. If Jesus has those feelings, then he's showing us how to have those feelings. They come up in us, right? But here's the thing about strong emotions, strong positive emotions or strong negative negative emotions. What do you do with them? How do they come out? They always come out. That's the first thing I want to say. They always come out. And the way they come out, come out differently. So the first way that they can come out, which is the most appropriate and healthy and healing way, is front ways. The strong feelings we have come out front ways. The second way that our strong emotions come out is sideways. And that's not the most productive way for our strong feelings to come out. But that's what they do sometimes. A third way we can handle our strong emotions is we escape from them, which then eventually leads to them coming out sideways. So they can come out front ways, they can come out sideways, or we can escape from them. So I'd like to tell you how those very three things happened to me in the last week. The first one, front ways, sadness and crying. When I was with the Meyer family, when I was with others, uh, and the other times that I have experienced grief in my life, there are moments when this strong sense and emotion of sadness starts to come up inside of me. A strong sense of it, of sadness. And what it does, it comes up. This is the way I experience it. It comes up and then it eventually comes out of my eyes. I cry. I cry very deeply sometimes. It's too much. There's too much of the sadness coming up and it has to come out. It's what we call catharsis. There's a catharsis that comes. And that's an emotion coming out front ways. When you're sad, cry. When you're sad, cry. Do not be afraid of the emotion. If you're sad, cry. And the times that that happens and I cry, I feel better after. It doesn't take away the sadness, but it releases the emotions that are coming up inside of me. So if you're sad, cry. 
real men cry. There's still the cultural norm that only women cry. There's this phase, fake masculinity of machismo that real men are, are stone. They're stoic. No. Jesus cried. He wept. So if you're sad, cry. That's one example of a strong emotions coming out the right way. Or the most appropriate way. Here's the second thing of emotions coming out sideways. A week ago, yesterday, I got back from the beginning of the planning of the funeral for, for Jameson. And I come back and I'm like, I really need to take a walk. I really need to take a walk. I need to go to Dunning Springs, one of those peaceful places that I like to go to. And I was changing out of my priest clothes into some jeans and tennis shoes and a sweatshirt. And as I was doing that, all of a sudden this sense of, of anger started to come up inside of me. Why did this have to happen? It just started to come up. And I started to yell out to the Lord. Why? Wailing. Anger. Expressing it. Appropriately. I was angry. But as I was changing, I looked out of my bedroom and I looked down into the parking lot right here. And I saw these men with all these instruments. And it looked like they were going to start digging up some ground. And I thought to myself, what the heck are they doing out there? What are they doing? I didn't hear anything about it. No one told me about it. You know, I feel responsible for the campus here at St. Aloysius. So I go down there. I did. I stopped and kept my priest clothes on, and I went down there, and I said, excuse me, who are you? What are you doing here? Started to be firm and kind of frank with them. Do you know what's starting to happen? The anger was coming out, and it was coming out sideways. And I was directing it towards those men. They didn't deserve that anger. And I caught myself. I'm like, oh, oh. You talk to so and so. Oh, okay. I'm 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 sorry. I'm sorry about. It. Just wanted to make sure that we're all on the same page. But I went down there in anger. Those guys didn't deserve it. That's emotion coming out sideways. Later in the week, I had sadness again. Do you know I wanted to do? I it was it was Saturday night after the funeral. I went and got Mabe's Pizza, went to the grocery store and got a four pack of Pseudo Sue from Toppling Goliath. I like that beer. Had the first beer, tasted good, had some pizza. Second beer, tasted good. Third beer, tasting really good. And I started to realize, you're, you're escaping. You're trying to feel better by this really good beer. I had one more to go. I could have easily have gotten that one open. I stopped myself. Thank you, Lord. I'm starting to escape from how I feel. That's what a lot of people do. That's why a lot of people do drugs. That's why a lot of people are alcoholics. That's why a lot of people look at pornography. That's why a lot of people sometimes are hoarders. They have strong emotions and they don't know what to do about them, so they escape from them. And eventually you have to go back to them. They get piled up and you're going to have to face them eventually. And that's where you could become a kegger bomb and go kaboom, coming out sideways. So with our emotions, you can deal with them front ways. You can deal with them sideways or you can just escape from them. I had the experience of all three in the last week, and the Lord stopped me each time and said, just be honest with me on how you're feeling right now. That was the sense I was getting. So that's the first part, how to deal with strong emotions. Okay, now I want to go to the next thing, which is awareness. And one of the most helpful things for me to be aware of where I am internally, spiritually, psychologically, emotionally, is to be aware of this really important distinction, thoughts, feelings, and actions. All that we feel and all that we do can always be traced back to a thought. 
the most important thing is to be aware of what thoughts we are receiving in our mind. And here's the thing. We have our own thoughts, but guess what? God places thoughts in our minds, but also the evil one can put thoughts in our minds as temptations. So that's why you always got to be aware of what you are, what you are, what you are going through. So here's an example that I have there on the, on the post. God has abandoned me. That's the thought. God has abandoned me. Have you ever had that thought come through your mind? I have. God has abandoned me. Why won't you help me? That's the thought. God doesn't help me. Right? If I believe that thought, do you know how I usually feel? I feel dejected and sad. And if I feel de de dejected and sad, that's going to directly influence possibly the way I'm going to act. So if God has abandoned me and I'm dejected and sad, there's a great temptation to quit going to Mass. What's the point? If God has abandoned me, there's no point in me going to worship on Sunday. Or you quit praying. Or you can become bitter. Resentment. Right? But it all starts with the thought, God has abandoned me. Here's another one, a positive one. I am loved and cherished by God. I'm loved and cherished by God. I'm filled with joy when I experience that. Then lastly, it can lead to a wonderful action of, I'm a listening ear to a suffering friend. If you're strengthened by God's love, then you then can share God's love with others. And it could be just listening to somebody who is suffering. It all goes back to the thoughts. Are you believing the thoughts that are true, that come from God? Or are you believing the thoughts that come from the evil one that want you to be derailed, discouraged, and eventually want you to, to destroy your life? So that gets to the, our next question. How do you know the thoughts you have are from God or God-centered? Here are the three markers that are... Good indication that the thought's from God. Number one, the thought is gentle. There is a gentleness to the thought. There is a sweetness to the thought. Number two, the thought is true. It is in conformity to God's truth. What he has revealed. What his church believes. Right. And thirdly, it leads to loving loving God and loving others. So if the thoughts are gentle, true, and loving, it's a good indication that those are thoughts from God or they are God-centered thoughts. How do you know some thoughts are dark thoughts? And everybody has them. Everybody has them. Everybody has dark thoughts. Everybody. The three marks of dark thoughts that are not from God. The first is they are harsh. Secondly, they're lies and half-truths. And thirdly, what's the effect of those thoughts? We turn in on ourselves. We have selfishness, obsessive self-concern and fear. If those are the effects of those thoughts, then you know they're not from God. I'll give you a common one that I struggle with all the time. I sometimes have the thought go through my mind, I'm a horrible priest. I should have done more. I don't work hard enough. All of those things. That's not a true, that's not a true thought from God. The harshness of it. Right? Okay. We're going to keep on going. The most important things to do with dark thoughts, because everybody has them. Number one is to acknowledge them. I'm having dark thoughts. I'm having thoughts that are not of God. I'm having thoughts that could really derail me. I'm, I'm, I'm having them. They're, sometimes there's no control over them. They just pop into your head. 
The second step though, is to tell God about them. Help me, God, I don't, help me understand these thoughts. Draw these thoughts out of me. Teach me what to do within them. Third thought, third action is bring the dark thoughts to the light. Bring the dark thoughts to the light. That's why our church believes so deeply about confession. Confession is bringing our darkness to the light. Our ability to bring our darkness to the light. That's what confession is. We do that sacramentally in the confession, but we can do that outside of confession by bringing what we struggle with to the light. To the light. So that's telling an appropriate adult. That's telling a, a really close and trusted friend. If you're a teenager, that's telling your parent, your grandparent, your teacher, your priest, your youth minister, your coach. If you're older, that's that's telling telling somebody who can truly help you. Bringing the darkness to the light. When you bring the darkness to the light, the darkness does not have as much power. And that's what the evil one wants you to know. You're the only one that has those dark thoughts. You're all alone in your struggle. Whereas the moment that we bring it to the light, we realize we are not alone. That's what makes that so important. Okay. Last thing is, everybody has dark thoughts. Dark thoughts that are not of God. Everyone has them. Everyone has them. And many times there are temptations from the evil one who wants you to walk away from God. Bring them to the light. Okay. Here's the last thing I want to say, and I do want to go over now to conclude our time together, over the church's teaching um, and Jesus' teaching. What does Jesus and his church think, feel about suicide? Um, I, 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 I just don't think people really know what the full teaching of the church is. And in order for us to grieve, we got to be rooted in the truth. So I just want to share with you, there are still memories of folks around here in our four parishes who know that if someone in the past 60 to 75 years ago committed suicide, they'd be buried outside of the Catholic Church's cemetery outside of the consecrated ground. That's what they would do back in the day for the long-term prohibition of suicide. There was always the fear of losing the soul of that person. But let's really go into what the church really believes, okay? Look at the first paragraph there. I have it there from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, 2280. Everyone is responsible for his life before God who has given it to him. It is God who remains the sovereign master of life. We are obliged to accept life gratefully and preserve it for his honor and the salvation of our souls. We are stewards, not owners of the life God has entrusted to us. It is not ours to dispose of. So it's to this idea that we believe in a God of life. God is the God of life. God gives life, God wills life, and God gives it as a gift. Every day that we are alive is a gift from God. Every day that we are alive, it is a gift from God, even if it's a very, 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 very difficult and dark day. Every time you get up out of bed, you are honoring God. Every day you get up out of bed, you are honoring God because it's a life that God has given you, okay? So we're not our own. God has purchased us at a price. We must honor the life. That's why God only has the authority to choose who lives and who dies. That's why murder is such a, it's a, it's a violence against our nature. Okay, look at the next paragraph now. 2281, suicide contradicts the natural inclination of the human being to preserve and perpetuate his life. It is gravely contrary to the just love of self. It likewise offends love of neighbor because it unjustly breaks the ties of solidarity with family, 
nation and other human societies to which we continue to have obligations. Suicide is contrary to love for the living God. Okay? We are meant to be alive. If someone would start choking you, you would try with all your heart, heart to stop that happening. Right? That's why we fight against death. Right? So suicide is going against that very, very natural inclination. That's why it's so serious. Okay. Look at the next one, 2282. If suicide is committed with the intention of setting an example, especially to the youth, it also takes on the gravity of scandal. Voluntary cooperation in suicide is contrary to the moral law. Okay. We can't help somebody else commit suicide. Okay. All right. So there's a gravity to this. You don't want to play with it. So I want to tell you a story from when I was in eighth grade. When I was in eighth grade, I had a very, very good friend, best friend, Paul Krustashik. And um, we didn't tell our parents. Maybe my mom and brothers and sisters are going to find out now in this video. We had a tree that we cut down in the backyard of my house. And Paul and I were pyros. We loved firecrackers, fireworks, M80s, fire of any kind. If you can get a fire going, we were there. So we had this really smart thought. Hey, maybe, maybe we should burn the stump. Oh, what can we do? Well, we could douse it in gasoline. Douse it in gasoline. So we go into the garage, see the gasoline kink for the lawnmower, and then we take it out there, take our matches with us, and we pour all this gasoline on the stump, and we, we light it, and it goes, <laughs> starts burning. But then the fire goes down. We try it again. <laughs> then it goes down again. And then I had a smart idea. I'm like, well, how about I pour the gasoline as the fire's still going? Maybe that'll get the stump going. I wasn't thinking. I wasn't thinking of all the consequences of that. So as I did it, as the gasoline was pouring onto the stump, it started to become a fireball. And I had to quickly put it out on the can. We all ran out of the backyard, Paul and I. What if that gas can would have caught on fire, would have exploded? What would have happened to me? I could have lost my hand, could have lost my face. There's a possibility I could have died. I wasn't totally thinking through everything. So let's get to the next paragraph. Grave psychological disturbance, anguish, or grave fear of hardship, suffering, or torture can diminish the responsibility of the one committing suicide. Sometimes people get in a very, very, very dark place and they cannot see the light in it. They don't think through all of the consequences. Okay? That's for a lot of people. That's why suicide is so serious because you can never take it back. Okay? So let's go to the last one, 2283. We should not despair of the eternal salvation of persons who have taken their own lives. By ways known to him alone, God can provide the opportunity for, for salutary repentance. The church prays for persons who have taken their own lives. If you're not totally in your right mind, you're not completely responsible. But that doesn't take away the seriousness of, of suicide. I'd like to tell you a story story about St. John Vianney, St. John Vianney. St. John Vianney is the patron saint of all priests. And he uh, was in his town and a group of parishioners came running, came running to him saying, Mr. So-and-so jumped off the bridge and committed suicide. He is eternally lost. And St. John Vianney said, we do not know that. Maybe as he was falling from the bridge to the ground, he thought to himself, God have mercy on me. I wish I hadn't done this. That's all that God needs. God just needs this much in order to get into our hearts. 
So that's why we are confident that we bring all those who have taken their own lives to the holy sacrifice of the Mass, our prayers for them, our love for them. And we pray that God can have mercy upon them. So that's where we can go. We go to God's mercy. All that God needs is a little bit. We don't know what's going on in people's minds and hearts. But at the same time, we say this is a very serious matter. So here's the bottom line I want to share with all of you. God wants you to live. God wants you to live. Do not play with the fire of suicide. Do not play with it. Every day you get out of bed, you are honoring God. Every day you get out of bed, you are honoring God. Here's the last thing. No one is beyond God's mercy and forgiveness. If you give him a millimeter, he will take it from there. That's how beautiful and infinite his mercy is. So, that's what I wanted to share with all of you. This is what I shared with our 7th and 8th graders. This is what I shared with our high schoolers. I really think this could really help you too. Let's face it together. And I want to end by reading from uh, one um, scripture from Galatians, um, which I just love. And we're going to end our time, and I'll get offline here today. Let me find it here. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. Can you please hold on a second? Hold on a second. Hold on a second. There we are. Okay, let me find it here. Okay, here it is. I'll end with this. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Galatians. Brothers, even if a person is caught in some transgression, you who are spiritual should correct that one in a gentle spirit, looking to yourself, so that you also may not be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so you will fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he is deluding himself. Each one must examine his own work, and then he will have reason to boast with regard to himself alone, and not with regard to anyone else for each will bear his own load. Let us help one another carry each other's burdens. And that's my prayer for all that we have gone through in the last week, brothers and sisters, that we truly become a Christian community in Christ, not in a school district, not in a, not in a town, not in our nationality, but we become one in Christ and help one another carry the burdens that all of us are carrying to live lives of compassion, gentle, gentleness, but truth that God can bring healing to us. That's my desire and prayer for all of us today. And may Almighty God bless you this day, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Peace be with you. Know of my prayers. If you want to talk, I'm always available. May God bless you.